Um, uh, Nancy and Louise asked, I'm oh, sorry, Nancy asked, can you do a webinar on editing raw photos? Uh, I have in the past and I can do again. Um, Louise said, here is Louise from Brazil. Is there a special price for upgrading to 2020 to 2021? Uh, we often send out emails uh, offering upgrades, but also you can just go straight to, uh, the answer to your question is yes, there is a special price. And just go into your uh, acdc.com and then just sign in using the like online portal there. Uh, and there, there'll be a prompt for you to upgrade at a, at a reduced price than the MSRP. Um, Lynn, I don't know the answer to your question. Uh, you can please email me. Uh, which is a price at acdsystems.com for everybody. If you want to email me with any questions you may have. Um, speaking of which, so there's a fair amount of content. Um, uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of things I, I I don't know the answer to, and part of the reason I, I you know I want to be fairly transparent about that from the beginning. Uh, even know that I've been doing these workshops for four years, or I mean five years, <laughs> five years now, uh, there's lots of stuff I won't know the answers to. So uh, during this workshop, uh, if that comes up, I'll just ask you to email me those questions. And what I often do is I, if I can't answer your question, uh, you know, myself, I'll, I'll get answers from our developers or our uh, quality assurance department and, and get back to you. I respond to pretty much everybody with their question that I can within a course of a couple of days after after the workshop. I just really recommend that people email me. And part of the, the benefit of that, at least for me, is um, I'm also able to send any like suggestions that our users have uh, directly to uh, our developers. So if they're saying like, hey, you know, I want to see a certain feature in the product, or I wasn't able to do this, or I'm curious about this thing, uh, I literally send that feedback directly to our developers. And they look at it and they go, great, this is another good suggestion, or this is a suggestion that we can do, you know, next year, excuse me. And what they do is they add that to their list of uh, uh, product uh, enhancements, things to tackle in, in future endeavors, that sort of thing. So yeah, please do that. Terry, I can do that. I'll write that down right now. That's a great suggestion. Uh, sky replacement, which actually would be sort of similar to some of the functions we'd be using. But yeah, I'll do a workshop on that. Um, or a tutorial if you'd like. Actually, that might be a good tutorial subject because it doesn't take that long. Okay, let's begin. I don't want to waste anyone's time. It's 104, this is a good time to begin. Okay, so I've got a little folder, a composition folder here. Let's see if I can find it, uh, February 23rd, yeah. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna navigate to a folder in a manage mode. And um, I've sort of worked on this over the last couple of days and I'm like, oh, I found a result that I kind of liked. So. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this base image here. And what we're gonna do is we're actually going to add to this base image. We're gonna add this gentleman here. <laughs> and we're gonna do that using a variety of different methods. And we're gonna get a composition that is in this case, oops, that's not the one I'm referring to, is going to blend him in both, not only in, the, in this case using different lighting effects, uh, we're going to blend him using different masking. We're going to use a, a copied element, in this case, this person's arm, to apply some sort of depth of field to this image. And then we're also going to go about using a blank image to create a bit of a, a shadow around this person. There's going to be a variety of different uh, factors that contribute to your success when you go to like add or um, you know add a, uh, an element, uh, a person to a group photo. Uh, obviously, you're going to need the space to add somebody to a group photo, so that that's a that's a, uh, a factor. The other thing is when you're bringing someone into a group photo, um, the less obstruction uh, from the background that you have, the better, because that's going to enable you to make much better selections. And then, uh, in regards to adding this person to this composition, I chose this image specifically because I thought, like, oh, this is interesting. We have all these different lighting effects around these people's feet. We've got these shadows going on. We have sort of like a, um, uh, not a sepia light, but a sort of a neutral light. And so we're going to sort of take into these factors into account and try to, like, add someone to this image using those, those elements. Um, this might be more common for somebody to do with, like, family photos and that sort of thing. Uh, and oftentimes, sometimes what people do is they'll take two separate images. Uh, the most common method that people 
um, you know, do with with family photos is they'll take two, uh, you know, still images that were taken like right after each other. And what they'll do is they'll just mask out somebody's face because one person wasn't smiling in the image or something like that. And so that's a very simple change. We're going to do a much more complicated change today. Um, so I'm going to open up my image in edit mode here. So I'm going to take this background base image that we're going to be using, and I'm just going to navigate straight to uh, edit mode. And yeah, at the very end, Gabe will show you this side by side. So a base image is this layer one here that we'll notice on the right-hand corner here. In order to, um, to add our, our subject to this image, what we need to do is we actually need to add another image to our, our layer panel here. And uh, there's a couple different methods to do this. Um, one of the methods is, let's see, I have the film strip turned off, so I'll add it here. One of the methods is to take an element from your film strip, uh, which I turned on via the panes panel here. Um, and I'm going to drag and drop my character, in this case, my second image, from the film strip onto my layer panel. Um, but if you, for some reason, don't have a, um, you know, don't have multiple images, or you're searching for uh, another image in your uh, in your repertoire, what you can also do is uh, instead use the. Um, oops, I'll just commit that for now. What you can also do is add another image uh, via the add file as a layer button down at the bottom right hand corner here. And what that will do is it'll add here. I'll just delete that guy for now. It'll add that layer to your layer panel as well. Uh, the reason why I'm showcasing this just as a summary is just a, a couple different methods by which you can add a new layer, a new image layer uh, to your layer panel. Lots of people don't know that you can add new images to your layer panel. I just want to showcase that there's a couple different methods to do this. Also, if you had like a window, uh, sorry, rather a, a window open, um, like a folder, you can drag and drop an image from a specific folder in Windows directly to ACDC, and it'll place it at the top of the layer panel as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to lower the opacity on this layer. So this opacity slider is going to, I'm going to reduce it to about, I don't know, 70, it doesn't really matter. But the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to get to know the relative position of where I'm going to be placing this person uh, in relation to the height of my other subjects here. I don't want this to seem like I'm adding somebody uh, to this image and uh, and not sort of understand where I'm trying to position them. So by lowering the opacity on this layer too, by selecting the layer and lowering the opacity, it gives me the ability to preview essentially what that image would look like at, when we finally go to make our uh, selection. So uh, if we lower the opacity a little more, you can see that our uh, subject, I'm placing them at a little bit shorter height than our other four, uh, four people here. And I'm just placing them slightly off to the right of this gentleman here. And the reason why I'm doing that is so I can actually use uh, this gentleman's arm to create depth of field by placing it essentially over our subject, which we'll get to a little later on in the video. So I'm going to increase the opacity because that's fine. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to commit this layer. So when you're moving a layer, uh, especially in this case, we're moving layer two over top of layer one. And we know that because there's this bounding box that appears around the edge of our image. And we know that we have a bounding box because it has these um, yellow nodes that appear on the edges and in the center. Um, when we're moving an image, one of the things we need to remember is that we need to commit this image or rather suggest to ACDC like, hey, this is finally, this is where I'm going to place my image. So whenever we see this bounding box, we just want to make sure that we commit the layer as soon as we're done moving it. In this case, I've moved it, I've resized my image, um, and then I've just sort of uh, tweaked it when I lowered the opacity there. Just as an aside as well, uh, you can increase the size of your image, uh, and in this case, it has a locked aspect ratio by just dragging the corners here. Um, if you want to unlock the aspect ratio, you just click this button right here, and it'll allow you to freeform trans transform it. And you can rotate your image by using this center node right here. Um, let's commit my uh, layer. So that places it, and it allows me to move uh, within it. Fred, 
To resize an image, you would just click on the move tool and make sure that you're, in this case, clicked on or uh, have an active layer as um, uh, whichever active layer you want to resize. So in this case, if I wanted to resize this layer, I'd click on the move tool and then those bounding box, that yellow bounding box would reappear, allowing me to resize that image. Okay, so what have we done? We've done two things. The two things that we've done is add a new file to our layer panel by navigating to underneath the adjustment layers. At the bottom left-hand corner, we've added a file as a layer. The next thing we've done is with that layer active, we've actively resized that image. And then we just used opacity as a means to uh, proportionally place our character, okay? So two things we've done so far. The next thing that we, we're about to do is the most important stage. Because you'll notice what's not good about this image is that we have our main character here, but we don't actually have an outline or um, of him yet. We don't have just our character. So in order to do that, what we need to do is we need to make a selection of him. Uh, we need to make a selection of him so that we can uh, get rid of the background, which in this case around our layer two is that white uh, background on our, the, on, our, on our layer there. And the reason why we're choosing to do that is so that we can fit him better in with this image alongside our other people in this, in this photo. So to make a selection, there's a variety of different methods, but I'm going to show you one method. We've done tons of videos on making selections. Um, and I just want to utilize this method for, for this video as to not confuse people. But just to be clear, the method that we're going to be using is using a combination of the magic wand tool and the brush selection tools. So earlier, um, when Fred asked, um, uh, you know, how to move a, a layer, which is the move tools right here, there's a section to the right of that that contains six tools. The brush selection tool, the polygonal selection tool, the rectangle selection tool, the elliptical selection tool, the lasso, and the magic wand. These are manual tools by which uh, you can make selections in ACDC. And I'm going to show you how to make a selection in ACDC. Before we do so, I'm just going to point out something too. So if you have a default version of ACDC, I'm just going to take a sip of tea here. If you have a, um, a default ACDC, you haven't adjusted your selection settings at all. One of the things I'd like to recommend to you is uh, to go to the select panel up at the very top here and go to the overlay options. By default in ACDC, when you make a selection, uh, it's using this marching ants method. I'm going to show you what that looks like just very quickly. So an active selection would look something like this, where I've made this uh, this, this uh, cursor selection, and it has this marching ants that appears around the edge of that active selection. This is fine by default, but what I actually prefer, I'm just going to deselect that and then go to the overlay options, I actually prefer the second method, which is called selection highlighted. Selection highlighted, what it does is it just shows you what parts of your image you've selected with an active color instead of those marching ants, which gives you a much better understanding, in my opinion, of the outlines of your selection. So what I'm going to be showing you today, uh, how to make those selections, is going to be using this selection highlighted function. Uh, I think it's just a better method than the marching ants. Um, but that's my preference, and you might have a different preference. So I'm going to click Selection Highlighted and hit OK. And then what we're going to do is we're going to navigate to the Magic Wand Selection tool. OK, and actually, I think what we're also going to do is we're probably going to zoom in a little bit on this side of my image, just a little bit. That's perfect. We'll probably zoom in a little bit more later on. OK, so the magic wand selection tool, when you click on a part of your image, it makes a selection based on all of the pixels that it thinks look similar. So if I just click on this gentleman's jacket, right, it's searching every part of that jacket that's connected for pixels that are a similar color. So with that selection uh, you know, complete, what you'll notice is that a good portion of our image has uh, turned this sort of red color which is good, because what that indicates to us is this is what is currently selected. 
So the magic wand is sort of like a, a mixture of a manual and a automatic method in the sense that it just adds to my selection the parts of my uh, parts of my image that I click on. Uh, it's going to add them based on a bunch of different properties, but most commonly color and tonality. So how dark a part of your image is, and then also what color the part of your image is. So I'm just going to go around and I, I'm literally going to click on parts of this this gentleman here and try to out make a you know uh, an outline of him. Um, one of the things I'll also mention is that when you're clicking, you might notice that uh, you're selecting very very little parts of your image. So if I reduce this slider that lo is located right here, it's called the threshold slider. If I lower that, when I click on a part of my subject, you might notice that it's very very gentle in terms of its selection. And all that is to say is that you might want to increase your threshold slightly to select larger parts or rather more connected parts of, of your image. The main method by which I'm going to make my selection is actually going to be playing around with this uh, threshold slider. Because if we increase that threshold slider, it might do a really good job of targeting, in this case, the pants when I clicked on it. But one thing is maybe it's going to do a bad job, right? when I select on that shirt there. So what I want to do is I'm just going to go back one selection by either control z or using the back arrow down at the bottom left hand corner here. And I'm going to actually have to reduce that threshold, it looks like, in order to select his shirt. Uh, but why I'm going to try to increase it slightly. Um, so you might ask, like, hey, Adam, <laughs> why don't you just select the background, the uh, the white part, and then inverse your selection. So go from selecting the white part to selecting actively just the character here. And that's a, a really good method. I just sometimes find that there's this like white edge that can appear around the edge of my subject when I use that method over using this method of sort of going through and selecting my, my subject himself. Um, selections in general are going to be the part uh, of, of doing this sort of process when we're adding a, a subject um, to another image. This is going to be like the most complicated part. And so I really want to kind of take my time with this and do a good job uh, with my selection, the best job I can uh, as, as possible, uh, just because I don't want there to be any fraying around the edges of my image. You've all seen a bad, uh, a bad you know, selection uh, and images, uh, you know, in, in local advertisements, you can see like hair is not uh, targeted and, and things like that. So we're just trying to avoid that. We're just wanting to make a fairly good selection right from the get go. So I'm using my magic wand and at a certain point, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to zoom in here. I'm just going to go down to this person's feet and we're going to go through and we're going to make active selections, avoiding that as we um, as we go. So you know, at a certain point, what we're just trying to do is just to get the outline of our character here. We don't need to get all these internal elements. What we're going to do is we're actually going to use the brush selection tool to get these sort of internal elements. We just want to get the broad strokes here. So I'm just going through and trying to get as many broad strokes that I, it appears that I have like a fairly good active selection here. Now, one thing I will also note is that um, there's a couple different selection uh, uh, like options just up at the top left-hand corner here. This is the case for all of the selection tools that are up at the top. Uh, there's new selection. And what new selection does is if I click on, say, the background here, instead of being an additive selection, in that case, adding to my current selection, it creates a new selection. And for when we're doing a, a selection with multiple components here that we want to capture, I would recommend just keeping it on add to selection uh, because that enables you to add a part and then add another part, et cetera. So, oops, I don't want to, there we go. So one of the things I want to do now is I want to go through the center of my selection and capture all these little, these little EDBD components. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually switch from the uh, magic wand tool to that of the actually the brush selection tool. And the reason why I'm doing this is actually just so I can paint in these areas because it's much more effective than sort of using the, the semi uh, automatic function of the magic wand tool. 
So I'm going to dramatically zoom in on my image here. And all I'm going to do is take this brush selection tool up at the top left here. Um, and then I am going to turn smart brushing to off, which I'll explain in a second here. So uh, Michael asked, how do you select and unselect the image? Well, we're showing you how to select the image. To unselect the image, you would go simply to select and then deselect or use the hotkey command Alt D. And that will deselect your active selection. Uh, so essentially, it'll remove this red part of our image. Uh, let's see, I'll just go Alt D here. And so Alt D removes it. And then actually to bring that selection back up again, I would just go to the undo section. So Alt D uh, or uh, deselect removes the selection. The other thing that's worth noting is when you're in a tool like the brush tool, for example, uh, what also removes your selection is just erasing your selection, right? So the brush tool works very similar to the, way, the normal brush tool where you paint on a color, except in this case, what we're doing is we're painting on an active selection. <clears throat> so um, I have smart brushing turned off. We're actually not going to utilize smart brushing in this tutorial. What smart brushing does is it, when you're brushing around your image, it searches for similar pixels. And again, it's going to use a mixture of color and tonality. And it's going to search for pixels that have similar values and accommodate for that. Um, as an example, let me see if I can find one. I'm just going to deselect a part of the hair here. I'm just going to just brush around it. And we'll show you what it would look like with smart brushing turned on. So smart brushing turned on, when you go to make a selection of this area, you'll notice that it's very subtly only picking up on the hair itself. So with this function turned on, you're only selecting uh, the hair and then the ear. And if you go further enough over, in a sense that you're you're selecting, uh, you know, the the white portion here, it'll indicate to you that that you've done that. So what you can do is you can just mix uh, uh, this magic brush using the left and right click to sort of find the best solution here. And as you're painting on your selection, what it's going to take into account is the color and tone of your selection, where you've placed your brush. So smart brushing is, in, in essence, a way to make um, so, uh, brush selections based on uh, certain criteria. Um, now what we're going to do, though, is we're going to turn this off. And the reason why is we just want to select parts of our image with completely non-discriminatorily. So we just want to go through and we want to fix the interior components of our, of our image. So I'm just going to go through and I'm going to fix up any parts that I don't like. Uh, with the hair here, uh, we can leave a little bit of these sort of splotchy little parts in the hair because they're actually going to appear kind of natural when we go to um, uh, when we go to finalize the selection. But what we don't want is parts of the center of our image our subject here to disappear when we go to make that selection. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to go through my image. And I'm going to clean up any parts that I wasn't able to select with the, uh, in this case, the magic wand selection tool. So I'm just going to go through and I'm going to clean up this image. And I'm, I'm this is this is important. So I'm going to take some time with this, and I want to I want to do this accurately. It's not going to take too long, but I do want to spend a bit of time on it to make sure that it's a good selection. There's no point in showing you how to how to do all of this unless we do a good job on the selection. So which is to say that this is going to be the most important part in this process of this tutorial. The rest is going to be about naturally blending in and, and making some, uh, some changes to our image. But this is going to be the part that, uh, that really sort of sets it apart. Um, another thing to note, too, is this is part of the reason why when you have images, in this case, you're bringing pr people in um, into your image, like this character here. One of the things that's going to make it super easy for you to do that is less comp complicated backgrounds. If you have more complicated backgrounds uh, in your image, I wouldn't, I would definitely not recommend using the um, uh, the, the the magic wand selection tool. What I would actually recommend is using the polygonal selection tool around your subject, which we can show at the very end if people are interested. But I'm just going through. I'm cleaning this up. So Gary asked, how are you switching from red image to original image as you're brushing? <clears throat> so Gary, as I said earlier, 
there's six tools up at the top here and all of them make a selection. So this red image that you're seeing, okay, all of this red area is on our image is it's just an active selection. And I'm gonna show you what at the very end, once we've completed our, uh, our selection, I'm gonna show you uh, what that's gonna do because the whole point of this selection is to remove our subject from his white background. Um, but the red area, don't think of it as a like a permanent change to our image. We're not permanently painting our image red. What we're doing is we're just actively making a selection uh, that we want to utilize in some way. We're going to do something with this selection. And the thing we're going to do is to isolate our subject from the background. Um, yeah, it'll all become very clear shortly. I'm just going through and I'm getting rid of any of these little spots in the genes and things like that where the magic wand missed. I just wanna be very, very uh, careful with this. This is a good example of an area where the smart, uh, smart brush turned on would be useful. So we just wanna capture these buttons here. So I'm just gonna to go to the smart brushing tool. I'm gonna to turn it to magic and I'm just gonna go in and I'm gonna paint this area here, maybe with the tolerance set a bit higher and I'm just gonna try to capture all of those little elements there without getting the white. That's pretty good. Maybe just around here as well. And when you're making a brush selection, <clears throat> when you use the left button that adds to your selection and when you use the right mouse button that removes from your selection. So remove, add, remove, add. Okay, so we're just about done. Just need to finish off these legs here. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to mask this part of our image. And uh, I will show you why that's important. Masking allows us to make some further adjustments to this, uh, this our subject here without uh, destructively uh, editing our image. It'll be all non-destructive adjustments. The other thing too is I figure like with these workshops, I can make uh, uh, um, a, you know, an automated selection. Like I can go in beforehand and make an automated selection of our subject, which I think is useful for certain things. But when the whole part of our, uh, our workshop here is sort of predicated upon showing you how to make a, a, an accurate selection, then I think that that would be a bit uh, too shorthand. So hence the reason why I'm going in and manually making this selection. I hope people understand sort of why I've, so, I've chosen to do that rather than just quick step around this by um, saving a selection, which I'll show you actually how to do because that would be a good good thing to understand uh, while we're, we're working on this image. Okay, so we're just about done. I'm gonna finish these boots and then we should be done. So again, all I'm doing is I'm not, I, I, I got the edges of my, uh, my subject primarily with the magic wand tool. So now what I'm doing is all I'm doing is just filling in the blanks that I didn't capture uh, with the magic wand tool. Okay, just get the rest of that. And once we're done this selection, I'll answer some of these questions that have popped up. So when you're making a selection, one of the things you can do is you can save that selection uh, if you plan on working more uh, with an image. And I do this from time to time. I think it's a helpful way to, um, way to sort of make a quick selection so you never have to do this process again. If you know, if you like know and like your selection when you made it, but you might want to utilize that same selection over again, then it's a good uh, habit to get into is actually saving that selection. Okay, so we're finished. I'm just gonna zoom out and we'll have a look. Okay, so here's my subject that I used the, a mixture of the magic brush tool and the uh, and the um, uh, the the sorry the magic wand tool. Um, oh, uh, Freddie asked, how do you uh, how did the selection show and automatically unshow? In the zoom function, when you use the uh, the uh, the hand tool, so when I when I zoom into my uh, image, 
and then I use the hand tool, it just it's just a rastering effect. It just pauses essentially the the uh, the selection just to illustrate to you where you're navigating to. It's just sort of like a quick handy um, reminder of what the edges of your subject looks like. So Freddie, that's that answers your question hopefully. But yeah, it's a, it's a bit odd. It can be a bit confusing uh, at first, but you know, the point of it is just to illustrate where you're going when you go to Zoom. Okay, so our subject is, our, we now have a selection. So let's save that selection just to illustrate that first. And then we're gonna mask our subject. So uh, you're like, hey, that took a while, right? Like that took probably eight minutes to make this selection. So let's save it so I don't have to do it again. So go to select and save selection. And I'll just name it guy, because that's who this guy is and hit okay. And the beauty of that is if I was to deselect my selection and go to load selection and load guy here, which is again, all from the select panel, either deselect or load selection, there he is again. So that's a very quick and easy way to do that. Okay, the next thing we need to do is we're gonna refine this selection. So one of the things I wanna show why we're gonna refine the selection is because what we're really trying to avoid is sometimes with a selection, there'll be a little bit of an outlining halo that are that where the little bit of white is, is selected in the process, just because near the edge of our subject, right? This is only gonna occur when you have images that have high contrast backgrounds. Sometimes when that occurs, what we wanna do is we wanna pull basically our selection slightly inwards so that we don't capture that white uh, edge. And I'll show you what I mean. Uh, refine edges is, is truly a refinement tool. So by no means is this something that you must or have to do, but I think I would just recommend getting into the habit of trying it at least. So once again, I'm gonna to go to select and I'm gonna to go to refine, which is fourth from the bottom here. And uh, this is only possible if I have an active selection. I can't refine if I don't have an active selection. So I'm just gonna to go to refine here. And you'll notice that my subject here has this like white uh, opacity that's that's running around the edge. And I, where it's probably most noticeable is in the, in, the, in the hair here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna shift the edge out um, way, way, way back. And I'll show you what this does. Uh, let's just go like negative part 60, just to illustrate, to showcase what this is doing. So this white color here, this opacity um, is, is what would be ultimately selected, right? Uh, when we finish this refine edge. Uh, there's whole parts of this person's jacket and face that are not in that active selection here. Uh, so this shift edge of a, a pretty dramatic negative 64 is not what we're looking for here. Um, adversely, if I was to shift edge positively, so we'll go up all the way to 57 here, you can see that if uh, if this is where what I end on a shift of uh, plus 57, then we've actually added to our selection here a whole bunch of this white that runs around the edge of our subject here. So this is the opposite of what we want. What we really want is just a light negative removal from the around the edge of this person's background. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to set the values here, and I'm just going to set it to a negative four, and we'll see what that looks like. So if we look at our image here, that's done a fairly good job. We could even maybe try a little bit lower that and see that what we think. Let's go negative seven and see how much that affects our image. And I'm just gonna scroll down to see what it looks like. Um, pretty good, there's low artifact counts here. So that's fairly good, but I'm kind of concerned about a little of the hair. That looks a little bit silly. Let's try with negative seven. If we don't like it, we can come back and re-refine. So I'm just gonna uh, set it to negative seven. I'm gonna leave the feathering as is. So we don't want there to be a soft edge to this. We want it to be a kind of sharp seamless edge. And I'm gonna hit done and let's see how this looks. So what you can see is when I hit done, it actually adjusts our, 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 um, our, our selection here. Um, and there's parts of our selection too that we might want to like reselect. There's a couple little of these squares that pop up. And this is because when we use the uh, magic wand selection tool, there's a couple little fragments that get missed in that process. 
Um, let's try uh, masking this image. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to re-refine this just to illustrate a, maybe a better refinement than even this. I'll show you in a second, Leo. Um, so I'm going to take my layer two, OK? And I have refined my subject. And what I'm going to do now is we're going to click on uh, this mask button, OK? And this is very important, so I'm going to uh, showcase it twice. What we're doing is we're creating a mask using this selection. And how that mask is going to be interpreted is it takes our subject, OK? takes our subject and it pulls him, it basically makes all of the background in this part of our image, the white part, right? It, uh, it um, hides that from view. That information isn't gone, it's just hidden from view. Um, if we have a look at this mask uh, box that appears to the right of our image, you can notice that there's our, our subject's uh, figure is depicted in white with the background depicted in black. And this is really important because when you apply a mask, what information is being instructed to you is the following. Black is turned off, so you're not seeing black. And white is turned on, and you are seeing white. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to deselect my selection. OK, so I'm going to hit Alt-D. And there we have our, our gentleman here. Uh, I, I don't think the refinement did a good, very good job in the hair. So we're going to go back and make that again. But overall, we can see that our subject is, is, is here. The background is removed. Uh, another element of this, which is, is, is good, is um, if we were to look at this mask right here, click on it, and go to invert, OK? we could see the inversion of whatever we've selected, the inversion of that mask. Mm -hmm. So by inverting our mask, we've also changed our little mask thumbnail here. Again, white is on, black is off. So our subject being our, uh, our, our, our gentleman's uh, you know, body here is, is turned black, meaning it's turned off. And then the white is on, the background is, is, is visible to you. So I'll just uninvert it. Anyway, um, I think the refinement could use a bit of tweaking. So let's go back and have a look at that. But the point is, and we'll re-illustrate how to make that mask. But the point is, at some point along here, we had an active selection. And then what we did is we, uh, we made a mask with that active selection to create this little uh, th mask thumbnail here. Okay, so we need to re-refine this. We made an error. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to the history panel, okay? The history is in the bottom corner here. And we're just going to go back to before we refined selection. So if we're right here, go to selection, I'm just going to double click on that. And there we are before we refined our selection. So let's try re-refining based on our new quality. And maybe actually before we re-refine that, let's just have a look at what this looks like on its own. So just before we re-refine, I'm going to take our layer with our active selection, the one we made manually, and I'm just going to click on Add Mask as a Layer, and I'll Alt-D. So it's pretty good, but as you can see here, there's a little thin white halo that appears on the right. And we might be able to remove that by refining our selection. So I'm going to Control-Z. Uh, control C again, and I'm going to go to select refine, which is control shift N as a hotkey. And instead of negative seven, which we did previously, I'm just going to go to negative four. We'll just try negative four. We're just going to do a slight removal and hit done. Let's see how this looks in comparison. And we've got some more work to do on this character, but once we're happy with that, uh, let's go to select deselect. And that white halo is much thinner now. And I think we can work with this image. We can make some further additional tweaks. The one thing I want to double check, I'm just going to zoom in. I just want to double check right here around the edge of our character's ear here. I noticed a couple spots that I want to fix. When we have an active mask, OK, so our mask is right here. 
And how we masked our image, once again, is we had that active selection and we just clicked on the mask button. When we have an active mask, one of the cool things about it is it's completely non-destructive. So we can take a brush, just a regular brush, not a selection brush. Our selection process is complete, right? We can take a brush and what we can do is we can actually add or remove from this mask by painting with the brush. So what we wanna do is we wanna paint white in the areas where we wanna see our subject here. And the reason why is because white is on, right? Black is off, white is on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make my brush white. I'm gonna do that by clicking on up here, there's these two boxes. We've got the um, foreground color and the background color. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to click on the reset colors to get a true black and a true white. And I'm just gonna to swap to white is in the foreground. And the reason why I'm gonna do that is because I plan on just painting in here, just fixing up any areas where I thought the hair and ears looked a little bit silly. And just gonna go around and smooth that out. I don't want it to be too sharp, especially around his face. So all I'm doing is I'm using, in this case, a white and black brush, which are foreground and background color. And I'm just painting using the left or right click. And again, right click paints black, which makes our subject off, right? It removes him and white paints over, it paints it back on. So we can utilize that method by going around our subject and just sort of painting any part on we think that should uh, that is missing, you know? So we can sort of further refine after the selection process is complete. I just wanted to il illustrate that just to showcase it very quickly. Uh, but that's fine, let's zoom in slightly. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna properly blend in our subject now that we have a fairly accurate selection. Uh, how, let's have a look at some of these questions. Sound is wonky. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad it's better now. Uh, Steven, hopefully that answers your question in regards to how we got rid of the original background. Um, yeah, and Ian, you can certainly select the uh, white background versus uh, the subject. Uh, and that's sort of what I showcased at the beginning is you can start by selecting the white and inverting it to make a selection. I just find sometimes when you do so, what you wanna do is you definitely wanna run a more aggressive refine selection. Uh, what if your background is similar color to your target? So if your background is similar color to your target, as I mentioned earlier, uh, what you really wanna use is polygonal selection. Polygonal selection, I'll cover at the very end of this video because it's not technically a part of what we're talking about, but I will talk about it. Uh, it's a much better selection method for when you know that there's going to be errors in automated selection. Is Refine an Ultimate 2020? I believe it is. It, it was added in 2020. Um, can't see here. Okay, so now that we've added our subject, <laughs> I'm going to do a couple things. First of all, this he's way too bright, right? Like looking at him in comparison to the rest of our subjects, uh, he's he stands out like a sore thumb. So the, what we wanna do is a couple different adjustments. The first adjustment I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make a straight up levels adjustment to our, our layer two. I'm gonna show, show how to do that. So what we wanna do is we wanna navigate all the way down to the bottom, okay? And under levels, I'm gonna click on the levels adjustment layer. The levels adjustment layer gets added to the top of our layer order. Now, if I just change the layer adjustment on its own, right? You're gonna notice that that's applied to our whole image. And we don't want that. We just wanna apply this levels adjustment to the layer that exists beneath it. To do this, what we do is we click on this clipping icon that appears on the left. And what clipping does is it says, this levels adjustment will be applied to just the layer two that exists beneath it. So when I click on that, it's just adjusting our subject here. When I make an adjustment, it's just being applied to him. With clipping turned off, the adjustment applies to the whole image. So 
he's too dark here. So what we would do is we take our midtones, and I'm going to take our midtone slider, which is in the center, and I'm just going to find a spot that I think works. And I think it's about there is where we're where we're happy with it. So without it and with it, it, he feels a bit more like he's a part of the image now, maybe even a little less than that. But I, I, that sounds, that feels more appropriate to me than this bright kind of almost washed out appearance where all of the light from the background is bouncing off of our subject. The next thing I wanna do is he's too cool in comparison to, and I don't mean like physical appearance, you know, I mean like he's cool in terms of his temperature uh, to that of the background. So the same thing I wanna do actually, I'm going to use the uh, white balance adjustment. So I'm gonna take white balance and it's gonna be once again added as an adjustment layer. And I wanna once again, apply a clipping method to this white balance layer which searches for the first visual layer underneath that layer and applies its adjustment to it. So let's warm our subject. I'm just gonna slide that yellow temperature up until I feel it fits better with the image here. Looks like there might've been some like tungsten-y sort of light in this image. That's what we're sort of looking for. And if I unclick, okay, this clip, you can see that that's then applied to the whole image. Here, I'll really egregiously change that so you can see what I mean. Clipped, unclipped, clipped, unclipped. Apply a clipping method, answered a question that has been kicking my butt. <laughs> glad to have, that's awesome. I'm glad that answers your question, Jimmy. Um, so I think it's about right there and then I wanna apply that clipping adjustment. So. Let's have a look, once again, let's stop, pause, and talk about what we've done. So we've made a couple adjustments here. So we took an active selection, and I'll just, let's just make a quick active selection. We took an active selection, okay? Just like this is an active selection, a much worse one. We took this active selection, we went to the select and refine function, okay? And we refined that active selection. Once we're complete refining that selection, we masked that selection by navigating to the bottom right-hand corner underneath the adjustment layers and masking that selection. So that masks it from view, whatever active selection we had. Um, I'm gonna undo that because that's really ugly. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna deselect this selection. So once those selection processes were complete, uh, what we did is all we've added are two layers. We changed the levels and white balance of our layer two, of the subject we're adding to this image. Then what we did is we clipped those layers. We clipped those layers to him because we know that we want just those adjustments to apply to our subject and not the rest of the image. Reminder, a composition image is a composition. So when we apply a general adjustment to our, our image, which we're like we're just about to do, it's going to affect our whole image. So there's a couple things that we uh, we still need to do. Uh, okay, this guy needs uh, for sure. Uh, he he fit. He again. He he looks like he's a kind of. Uh, he's very much. Um, What's the word for it? He's popping out of this image too much. So the a couple of the other things we wanna do is we wanna give him a shadow. And we're gonna give him a shadow manually, but we're also going to apply an effect, uh, an effect directly to the layer itself. And then the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take this subject's arm, okay? We're gonna take his arm and we're gonna paste it over top of our layer two, our layer two being this gentleman. We're gonna paste his arm over top of layer two so that it gives a sense of depth of field to our, um, our image. It doesn't feel like he's just been robustly placed over this image. We really wanna give him a place in this image and we do so by giving him a little bit of depth of field. So the thing I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna add a manual shadow. To add a manual shadow, I'm gonna add a blank layer, okay? To add a blank layer, you navigate underneath the layer panel here and there's a plus button and it just adds a blank layer. Now it's going to add a blank layer above whatever layer you currently currently selected. So if I was still actively on this white balance layer and I added a blank layer, you'll notice that it pops up above it. 
Um, where we actually want to place this, uh, this blank layer is underneath of our layer two. The reason why we want to do this is because we want a shadow to appear behind our image, not in front of him. If I had this layer in front of him, and we were to take, in this case, a brush and brush on a, uh, a, a black shadow behind him, pardon me, I'm going to reduce the opacity to do so. But if we were just uh, paint on a black shadow, uh, well, that's going to appear in front of him. And the reason why is because this layer three uh, appears above our layer two in the layer order. So what we need to do is we need to take this blank layer. We actually need to shift it behind our subject. And you're probably thinking, wow, that's way too dark. And you'd be right. So I'm going to erase that, actually. Um, so I just want to point out that that is beneath layer two. In this case, the layer order matters. OK. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fill this entire layer three with the color black. So I'm going to navigate to our fill tool, OK, which is the paint bucket. And I'm going to take black, which is this foreground color. OK. And I'm simply going to fill this entire layer three. And I want to be clear that I'm clicking on layer three, not on our layer two with our selection, not on our layer one. I'm going to fill our blank layer. And as you can see, <laughs> that's weird, but I need to fill that too. Uh, what that does is it fills our entire background with black. And to accommodate for the boot here, I'll just paint on the rest here. So we're just going to paint there. We've filled our whole layer with black. What we're going to do is we're going to add a mask to this layer. Uh, so let's do that. I'm going to click on our layer three, and I'm going to navigate to the mask tool. Again, this is the same mask that we applied to our layer two. I'm just going to add a mask to it by clicking Add Layer Mask. Now, earlier on, I mentioned something. When our, our selection is white, right? Or rather, when our mask is white, it's turned on. And when our mask is black, it's turned off, OK? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this mask, and I'm actually going to invert it. And what that would do is the mask would now appear as black, which means that the black background that we have is turned off. It's no longer visible. You might be thinking, Adam, why am I doing this? Why am I creating a black background layer and then masking it off? This is counterproductive. I've done, I literally just did nothing, right? Well, no, because what I can do is take this mask now, okay, and non destructively, Okay, with this black mask, I want to be clear that I'm not selecting the black layer. I'm selecting the mask to the right of it. And we'll know it's a mask because the mask properties pop up. I'm going to take this layer, and I'm going to take a white brush, brush with a foreground color of white, and I'm going to dramatically reduce the opacity. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paint white. And by painting white, the background of black appears visible. Uh, I probably need to crank down the opacity on this. Actually, let's do it just from here, not to confuse people. So I'm going to undo this uh, this part of our, our, our mask. And the beautiful part about uh, having a mask like this is that whenever I paint on white, again, painting with the uh, foreground color of white, what it does is it uh, it just it adds it again to view, so we can mixture we can swap between uh, basically white and black brushes to either add or remove uh, this character character shadow, and I'm going to dramatically increase the feathering on our brush here just to get a little bit of a shadow in the background behind our subject here. I'm going to go around and just add what I perceive to be a bit of a, a shadow behind our subject. And I'll maybe make it a bit sharper in here. This doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to basically fill this section with what you perceive to be a bit of a shadow. So he feel, fits in better with the image. So if we have a look of just this image on its own, so if we just take, uh, <laughs> if we hide using the I function, if we just hide our subject, you can see what that uh, that um, 
that shadow looks like. You can see where it's placed and what it looks like. So the other thing I'm going to do is because that shadow is nice, but I'd also like to add a, uh, a shadow just over our layer two here. And what that's going to do is it's going to homogenize him better with the uh, rest of the uh, characters here. So I'm going to take this layer two, which is not the shadow layer, but actually the selected layer itself, the, the gentleman here. And I'm going to navigate all the way down to the FX panel, OK? FX just applies effects to the selected layer. So when I click on it, you'll see that this uh, effects uh, pop up will, will show up. And we're going to add a shadow to our character here. So I'm going to click and make sure that shadow's added. And I'll take a look at him. And then we can dramatically reduce the opacity and add blur and distance. We can change the direction of where that shadow comes from. Um, and sort of find a, a shadow that we feel fits as well with the manual one that we've added. These are two separate methods of adding our shadow. So if I increase the distance, if I was to dramatically decrease the blur, we can see better where the, where the direction is coming from. Uh, but I think we're happy with it about there. The other thing I'm going to do is you can add multiple effects at the same time. So we've just added a shadow currently, but what happens if I wanted to add like an inner shadow at the same time? So we're gonna take this inner shadow and I'll just click on the inner shadow settings and we can play around with these as well. We can sort of adjust where this appears on our image. Uh, good thing to do is you can sort of change where the direction is facing once again and sort of find a inner shadow that sort of fits with the image as well. And these things are just sort of general tools uh, that allow you to sort of craft a better image that fits. Because a lot of this is lighting conditions that are controlled. In this case, you've got like maybe uh, shadows coming from the back of your, your subject. So we're going to sort of do our best to sort of find a, a method that we think works well. Uh, and then when we're done with these layer effects, you'll we can hit close. And you'll notice that there's a little FX a uh, pop-up that appears to the right of our image here and the right of the mask. And if I ever wanted to adjust these things in the future, I would just click on that FX panel and you'll notice that it pops up with, again, non-destructive FX settings. So that's possible. I'm going to zoom out a bit and there's a couple more things we want to do. But I just want to focus on, I showed you two different methods of adding inherent shadows to your image. We did the one manual method where we basically just uh, created a black background and added a mask to it. And that mask enabled us to non-destructively um, you know, add a shadow. The other thing you could do, it's unfortunately uh, more of a destructive change, is you can just add a blank layer and just like add a shadow with a black brush to directly to the blank layer. I just prefer the layer three method here that we've added just because it's a bit more non-destructive. And then the other non-destructive method that we showed to add a shadow was using the FX panel itself. OK? Uh, I'm going to add a, um, another adjustment to this image. And this, I think, is one of the most important ones other than the selection process. And that's I'm going to add a uh, photo effect to our image. Now, this can be a lot of things. You can make a general levels adjustment. You could add a vibrancy adjustment. You could do a lot of things. I'm just going to showcase this with a photo effect. Now, what a photo effect is going to do is it's very important that it's at the top of our image and unlike our other adjustment layers, is not clipped. The reason why I'm doing this is uh, when we're making a uh, when we're adding someone to an image, okay, we want to utilize a, a, a method to give our uh, our image a homogenized appearance, as if it's all the same component. And while I think we did a fairly good job of matching the, the color and the warmth uh, with our new subject, uh, another sort of surefire way, way to really like make everyone appear and look like they fit is to just add an, a photo effect to the very top of your image that is applied to all of your characters, in this case, all of the subjects. Um, I'm going to change this photo effect because currently we had it set to Sophia, which is this kind of pink and blue effect. Uh, I'm actually just going to change this to a sepia effect, OK? And what I'm going to do is, after changing it to a sepia, I'm going to dramatically reduce the opacity to about 30. 
And the goal with this sepia um, photo effect is to just once again, apply a sort of a homogenized effect that I can see is affecting everybody in our image here. Not just affecting our subject, but affecting everyone to give this appearance visually that uh, almost as if everybody belongs, okay? The last thing I wanna showcase uh, before we compare this image to the original, okay? The last thing I wanna do is I wanna take this gentleman's arm and I wanna make a selection of it and I'm gonna place it over top of our layer two. So it's going to be in the foreground where our layer two, uh, at least the where the part where his arm appears is gonna be uh, in the background. So I'm gonna do this. And I think actually this is a great opportunity to showcase the polygonal selection tool. So uh, earlier I've had a couple of people ask me, Paul asked, uh, will you please cover extracting someone from a more busy background? Um, this is a great example. So let's do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide my layer two and I'm going to hide the shadow. And because uh, we, we we're going to need these. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in. OK, I'm going to zoom in pretty far. And I'm going to navigate to my layer one. And I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to make a selection of, oops, keep on accidentally selecting the shadow there. And I'm going to go around and I make a selection of this guy's arm. And we're going to do that using the, uh, we're going to use that doing the polygonal selection tool. And uh, you probably ask, well, why are we going to use this method versus what we did previously with the magic wand tool and the brush tool? Well, the reason why I've selected the polygonal selection tool is because First and foremost, a lot of the colors right here, okay, a lot of the colors are uh, very uh, mid tony They're like, there's not a lot of contrast between my background and my, uh, my gentleman's shirt here, which means to say that automated methods, like for example, um, the, uh, the magic wand selection tool, it's gonna really struggle uh, in this area. Where my eye doesn't struggle, the automated selection methods are going to struggle. Uh, and as for the brush selection tool, yeah, you could certainly clean up using the br brush selection tool. But we're going to use the polygonal selection tool instead of the wand. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to go through here and click on this gentleman's shoulder. And I'm going to work my way down. And I'm going to add a bit of buffer room on the right. So my selection appears like just the shoulder right now. I'm just adding buffer room on or rather on the left here uh, so that when I go to add my subject, there's enough. It looks like there's enough uh, on the left here. Uh, it looks like there's enough uh, to cover over that image. What I'm going to do is uh, much like the um, uh, the other selection methods, we're using the add to selection. Okay, we're using add to selection method, uh, and the reason why is because we don't want to be creating a new selection as every time we go further down uh, this uh, person's arm. We want to be adding to that, and to showcase that, I'm just going to click here, and I'm going to navigate around here and add this section now to the active selection. And I'll navigate slightly down, maybe down a bit more. And I'll just go around here and add this to the active selection. And so we have about that now. And I'm going to add this to the active selection. His little um, booklet here. And all I'm doing is I'm just literally going around the edge of our subject to my own eye. That's really it. And I'm going through and I'm just adding as much as I can to the selection process. And the hand is the last part that we'll need to do here. And this is going to a little bit, this is going to look a little bit wonky in comparison to our previous selection because our previous selection was the entirety of that person's body where this is only a portion of this person's body. Uh, we can go around a little bit of the pants as well here. And so, oops, and I'll just cover that up as well. 
Okay, so here's here's what our selection looks like. Let's zoom out. So here's our selection, which is fine because the only part of our selection matters is that right hand portion that goes around here. So what I'm going to do is now that I have this active selection, I'm going to duplicate my layer one. Okay, I'm going to duplicate it. And then I'm going to create the, a mask on this duplicated layer one copy one. So with our active selection, again, we know that we have an active selection because of this red area here. I'm going to click on our layer one copy one, and I'm going to click on the add layer mask button. Now this doesn't look like anything yet. I'm just going to deselect. But what I can do is I can place this over top of my layer two here. So I place this over top of it then it looks like we're hiding him in the background of that. We're adding a bit of depth of field to that part of our image. I want to also note that I'm placing this layer above the white balance adjustment that is clipped to our subject here, right? And the reason why I'm placing it above it is because if I didn't, then suddenly his arm is now uh, the subject of this white balance adjustment. If I move even further down, now his arm is the subject of our levels adjustment, right? So we want to move that above that, but below the photo effect that's affecting absolutely everything on our image. So what I'm going to do now is this is functionally complete. I want to save this as an ACDC file. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go, yeah, we'll just go base image two, and I'll save that as an ACDC file. The reason why I'm going to save this also as a JPEG is because you may notice that while you're doing your selection process, uh, there might be some anti-aliasing that will appear on the round the edge of your subject that when you go to save this as a JPEG, that's not straight up just not going to appear in your final image. So let's save this as a, uh, oh, actually before we save this as a JPEG, <clears throat> but maybe the last thing I'll do is I'll just use the resize canvas tool which is up at the top left-hand corner on the menu. And I'm just gonna get rid of, I'm gonna center this image uh, because we have about yay amount of space on the right and we wanna roughly copy that. So I'm just actually gonna resize this entire canvas so that it's, it feels more centered. And uh, with that complete, now we'll save it as a JPEG. So I'll take this, go down to save as, and I'm gonna save as a JPEG. We're going to call our image base image 2.jpg, or actually uh, final edit, and just click save. Um, it's going to prompt me to flatten all these layers. This is intentional. Now we're saving as we've already saved uh, our ACDC file, which is the non destructive file, meaning that's the file that we can open up at any other point in the future and edit our changes. Now what we're doing is we're purposefully making a copy of our image. We're saving our image as a JPEG because we intend to flatten the file. So this is OK. So we'll click OK. And then the last thing we're going to do is let's just have a look. I'm going to go back to manage mode. Um, so let's get out of here. Oops, how do I? Oh, well, I'll just slightly minimize that to click on manage mode. Unfortunately, the zoom controls are hiding it from view. And then what we're going to do is we're going to compare our base image in manage mode to that of our new image. So I'm going to click those two images. I'm going to right click them and I'll go to, uh, there should be a way to compare, compare images on the right. And that'll bring up our compare function so we can view the two images side by side which I think, and you'll notice that on our subject, that anti-aliasing is gone. We can now see our subject very good. And there we've done our, our way of, in this case, our best method of copying our subject from one image using that of the masking functions and applying it to another image. And again, the other tools we used in this, in this video is we've um, completely uh, adjusted our image uh, using refine selection. We've used, uh, we've used the clipping function on adjustment layers to just make application changes uh, to, or in this case, filter changes to one of our subjects, uh, this gentleman right here. We've used a general adjustment over top of all of our layers to apply a sepia tone that gives it a slight uh, bit of homogeneity. 
Um, we've used another gentleman's arm, right? We've used the arm itself to give our image a bit of depth of field. And then lastly, we used a combination of FX effects over top of our layer and also uh, added a, basically a blank layer that we've utilized to create an inherent shadow on our subject. Um, yeah, John Pierre, his face seems to pop out a bit more than the other subjects. Yeah, I mean, I think partially one of those reasons is because there's always gonna be better selections that you can make than I could illustrate in uh, in this video. And then the other thing, a reason why I think his face pops up is partially my own fault when selecting an image. He's looking off to the right rather than looking to the center of our image, which I think would uh, blend him better in with it. Um, if I was to select a, a character that I think uh, was looking more, more to the foreground rather than off in the distance. Uh, and I think that's part of the reason why his face pops out a little bit. Um, so that's the workshop today. There's a whole bunch of questions I haven't had a chance to answer. So I'm gonna go through and answer them if I can. Uh, but that sort of covers the gist of, of adding a subject to an image. And we've looked at a little, a couple different methods of selection, obviously the wand selection method, the brush selection method, and even introducing the polygonal selection for, for where we thought that it, uh, a part of our image was gonna be too complicated uh, to do in an automated function. Uh, okay, question time. Let's answer some. Uh, okay, um, let's maybe start at the bottom and work our way up. Um, sunsets and sunrises. Sure, I'll add it to my list. That's a great suggestion. Sunsets and sunrises. Um, and Sharon, if there's anything specific about sunsets or sunrises, uh, maybe shoot me an email. Although I feel like I, you might have already shot me an email in regards to something else recently. Uh, but please. Uh, also, just as a as a note, once again, my email is aprice at accsystems.com. And then if you go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash ACDC photo studio, that's where you can watch our videos. Uh, Simon says, great session. Thank you so much. Need to go. So yeah, absolutely. We'll take a look at um, uh, on our work uh, workshop page playlist on YouTube for, for this, if you would like to rewatch it. Um, Patty, glad that the demo answered your question. Adrian, superb. Thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, Peter asked, thanks Adam, another great presentation. Is it possible to flip mirror horizontally just the layer two image while it's maintaining its aspect ratio? Yeah, but there's not a way to do that in edit mode, unfortunately. It's actually a feature that I've asked for in edit mode. Uh, but what you can do is prior to starting your, uh, your image, right, prior to placing your image, what you can do is you can take your layer, your, your guy before you're about to select him. And then literally what you can do is you can copy, paste him into your folder and then just use the batch function to flip them. Um, so you can flip them right in the batch function. As you can see, I can flip him using this tool. Uh, unfortunately, that's a uh, function. That is a, uh, the flipping aspect in edit mode is a bit of a limitation. Um, so I would just recommend uh, starting the process by flipping your subject if you wanted him to appear uh, in the opposite direction prior to making your selection. <clears throat> um, Uh, let's see here. Douglas asked, I did not see most of the questions here. Should I? Uh, yeah, they should be all visible. Um, Ib asked, when selecting colors, background, et cetera, is it popular to select similar? When selecting colors, uh, yeah. If you go to edit mode and you go to the color picker, one of the things you can do is just use the color picker to select colors that's in the background. Alternatively, the eyedropper tool also uh, selects colors. So if you wanted to reference a color uh, that's already on your image, you can do so that way. I'm not sure if that answers your question, Ib, though. Um, thank you, Juicy. Uh, Delton, thank you once again. Douglas, uh, let's see, Les, where can we review this section? Uh, you can review it on our YouTube uh, page, which I uh, linked just a second ago. Uh, should be up in two days. And I'm glad you liked it. David asked, are subjects you added is better focused or contrasty than the group? Or could a slightly blur be added to make a sharpness of the added figure be slightly controlled? Yeah, so let's go back to our, um, I'm gonna go back to our 
uh, subject here, or uh, the, uh, I'm gonna, rather, I'm going to go back to the ACDC file, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, bring it up in edit mode again, and all of our adjustments will be there, which allows us to edit them. And one of the things that we can do is we can go to this FX panel here, okay? And reopen that FX panel and, uh, uh, da, 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 what's going on here? Uh, well, we can add a slight blur. There's some issue here. Uh, okay, well that method's not gonna work because there's an issue with the effects here. But what we could do is we could take, uh, once again, our subject, right? Our layer two. And in this case, what we can do is add a blur adjustment uh, above him and clip it and dramatically reduce the opacity, right? So we can add either, we can use the a mixture of the strength itself or the opacity to really uh, add him to the image, or add a blur to our image and play around with those two, uh, two functions. So a mixture of blur and clipping will uh, address your, uh, your concern there. David, uh, thank you, Harris. Thank you, Norm. Uh, why do white pixels on the edge of his pants disappear when it's saved as a JPEG? I don't know. I think it's an anti-aliasing issue that hasn't been resolved, um, to be quite honest with you. I, because I've, I've noticed this in other photo editing softwares in the past where that same issue will occur, where the anti-aliasing will appear. But then when you go to save it as a JPEG, or honestly, even if you view this file, it doesn't even matter if I, um, if it's a, it doesn't even matter if it's not a, a saved as a JPEG. If I just navigate over to manage mode, right? And then view the file, the anti-aliasing is, is gone. So I think it's a display anti-aliasing issue. Now, again, all I'm doing is viewing an ACDC file. So um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I just, I think it's a common issue with, uh, with selections in photo editing softwares. Uh, Norm asked, wow, very good. So much technique. Okay, well, you're welcome. Ian asked, after a saved ACDC, can you explain the loading that, uh, that takes place? Yeah, it's, it's um, the loading of the file. Well, the loading, uh, it's essentially loading the base layer and then all other subsequent layers that, uh, that are applied. If you want to reduce the size of your layers, you can sort of, you can collapse layers that you don't need to edit, meaning that you can merge them down with another layer. Uh, if you want to reduce the size of your file too, um, you can, uh, let me think. You can uh, try not to duplicate layers as much. So, for example, in the instance where I could have, uh, I had his, I made a selection of his arm. Well, I could have just copy and pasted that that layer uh, instead of duplicating the entire thing. It's just the the one thing is I lose uh, non-destructive uh, abilities when I copy and paste. So I, I kind of prefer to do as much non-destructiveness as possible, but that will increase the file size. Um. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a much larger file than just the base image. That tool automatically adds a red mask to it. Uh, no, that was something that we did using the selection method. Um, so in edit mode, uh, remember at the very beginning of the workshop, um, what we did is we went to select and overlay options, and we changed the overlay options to selection highlighted from marching ants, which is the default. I do not like marching ants. I prefer selection highlighted. I think it's easier to work with. Uh, so the tool does not automatically add red. You had to go in and adjust that yourself. Uh, does ACDC have a content aware function? No, but this is something that I've requested. And if you want to request that, please request this, <laughs> email me, uh, because I'd like to see it in the product. And it's something that I, I think that our, has been asked for quite a bit and that uh, we're stressing to get it in the product. So Terry, uh, please email me so I can send that to our developers because uh, I agree with you. Lots of good info, glad of it. Um, Uh, is it possible to change the angle of focus in the subject's eyes? Um, that would be a subject of a totally new workshop. I think so, but it would be it would take some time. Um, uh, yes, it's going to be recorded on our YouTube page in two days. How do you clip to the selection image? You just click the star. There's a little diamond that appears on an adjustment layer. On an adjustment layer, you can click that diamond to clip it to the layer beneath it. 
Um, awesome. Glad that Jamie is, re oh yeah, is refined selection only accessible in the latest version? I believe it was introduced in 2020. Uh, but I could be wrong about that. It might've been 2021. The, the features, they just blend together when you've worked for a company for five years. Um, yeah, you can add a selection on the book. Um, you can add a new blank layer beneath uh, the book. That actually would have been a good idea because I've, I've added our, our uh, subject's hand here. What would make sense is adding a little bit of a, a shadow beneath it. Once again, you can do that uh, by using the FX panel. Or you can do that by adding a new blank layer and just manually going in and adding a shadow. Um, Adam, is it preferable for you a single email with several questions or several emails with a single question? Um, excuse me. Um, try to be as concise as possible in one email would be my uh, preferred method. Um, Lynn asked, if you import the second photo as a watermark, isn't there a remove background choice? Uh, watermark. Well, that's only the case if your file already has the background removed and it's a PNG. Uh, that's not going to work for uh, for what we're trying to do here, unless the image has already had its background removed, which in this case just added as a file and you don't need to add as a watermark. Um, Antonio, you're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, so to change the size of your brushes as you're painting, uh, is all within this tool, uh, the nib width function. So when you have the brush or rather the brush selection tool, there's a size of, uh, there's a nib, nib adjuster uh, or the feathering adjuster. Now, you might also notice that when I'm adjusting, uh, I can change the size without clicking on that little interaction method here. The way you do that is by using your scroll wheel on your mouse. So if your mouse doesn't have a scroll wheel, that this function won't exist. But if your mouse does have a scroll wheel, then you get this function, which is pretty cool. It's actually very useful. Uh, Jim asked, why don't you select the white background and then invert the selection? Um, totally up to you. It might be better uh, depending on, on what image you're using. And again, uh, the reason why, I just wanted to show a more complicated selection than a uh, easy one. Um, it's uh, very easy to make a selection of the background and invert it. Uh, but one issue I've noticed too is that there can be a bit of a tracer edge that appears on uh, in your image, and we did, did our best to remove that using the refine uh, find function. Um, okay, yeah, that's it for me, friends. Uh, that's about as many of the questions as I can answer. There's probably a whole bunch that I wasn't able to answer in this uh, workshop, I and mean, if that's the case, just email me, and I'll try try to get back to you soon. Um, I'm glad that that was educating for you, Ib. I know you're familiar with a lot of these concepts already. Uh, Donald, you're most welcome. Stefan, thank you. Um, what's uscomaton? I have no words. <laughs> I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> it's like a mensch. <laughs> Uh, with either way, thank you. I, I'm taking that as a compliment. <laughs> um, awesome. Thank you so much, Leo. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Ib. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Anthony. I'm glad that was helpful to you. Yeah, that was a fun session. I mean, it's a kind of a it's it's definitely one of the more uh, one of the more complicated uh, workshops I've done. Um, but yeah, if if you're getting a lot out of it, that's good. Okay, friends, I'm going to, uh, I, I need to take a sip of tea and I've been talking for an hour and a half. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute my mic, but I, once again, I'm just going to pop my email and our YouTube channel in the chat here, just so you can grab that if needed. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday or if you're in Australia, your Wednesday. Um, and um, yeah, have a great rest of your day and I'll talk to you soon and um, check out our next uh, workshop on our workshop page. Thank you.